everybody, and welcome to the COVID innovation track presented by the Texas Military Department. I'm Sean Duffy. I'll be your host for today. You'll see me periodically uh, throughout today's sessions to help direct you and answer any questions that you may have. Don't hesitate to reach out through the chat, whether you're joining us through YouTube or through the Hopin Interactive platform. While I'm not hosting interactive conferences like Fed Supernova, I work for Capital Factory through our Corporate Innovation Council program, and I've had the pleasure of working with many of the presenters that you'll hear from today, and I can assure you that you are in for a great day of programming. I'm excited to kick off the day with all of you guys. A little bit later, we're actually going to hear from some startups in the Capital Factory ecosystem who are on the front lines of developing technology to fight COVID-19. We also have a panel that's going to be moderated by Capital Factory's own Melly Price, featuring Army, Air Force, and TMDX representatives who are touching on the process of pivoting the DOD and innovation organizations who are fighting and finding COVID solutions. Right now, I'd like to welcome to the stage Jason Kelly from IBM to kick off the track and introduce our first guest. Welcome, Jason. Hey, thanks you, Sean, and uh, thanks for having us here today. I'm proud to be here uh, uh, with all of you in this wonderful COVID in in innovation track, which kind of sounds like a, a, an odd track to be uh, leading here. I must tell you that uh, uh, as a, a, a proud member of a, a company that has helped to uh, bring about a robust response to COVID-19, uh, it is a topic worthy of all of us talking about because we've been forced to learn from it, uh, whether we like it or not. So more about me, I'm Jason Kelly. Uh, as mentioned, as Sean mentioned, I lead IBM's blockchain business uh, around uh, the world. Uh, we're 120 countries, uh, every continent except one. And we talk about this thing we call blockchain uh, as an innovative capability. I'll hit on some of that, but that is not the topic for today. Instead, it's the innovation part of that. And yes, uh, that B word is part of the innovating thing uh, that we are driving in our company. But as a company, like all of you on the phone, we all took a step back uh, in a very unique situation that we have all found ourselves in. If we think back uh, early March, it, it was uh, the time where we thought, okay, this is getting bigger. This is going to change the way we do business, the way we work, live and play. But certainly, as you're staring at me uh, in my not so glamorous office that's not an office, uh, we never thought it would get here. However, as a company, I'll give some, some thoughts on how we looked at it and maybe use it to, to set up the conversation I'm looking forward to have with General Farrell with regards to how we all have reacted when we first thought, okay, this is uh, a pandemic and we're going to have to figure out how we sustain first ourselves, and as we all thought about our families, no different. We as IBM thought about our employees and their families to make sure that they were safe, to make sure that, that on top of them being safe, we could continue to deliver on our mission, which is our clients first and innovation that we bring for them. What was really interesting to see happen is as a, a very uh, services-based and technology-focused cloud-based company, it was surprising how easy, and I, and I say that with pride for all of my 400 plus team members uh, around the world when we said we will work from home. On day two, when we made the mandate that we would work from home, 95% of our team members were working from home. Within that first week, we had 98% of our teams in India, which is not a work from home environment for any of those who know that. I'm typically there three, three times a year. I don't think that's going to happen this year, but we know that in that time frame, one day, 95% of our teams working from home, taking on what has become their new way of working every day, and 98% of our people being able to say, look, I'm here in India and I'm working from home as well. And that's mean a lot of, of infrastructure that has to be shifted virtually. Why do I use that example? One, because it was us taking care of our people first, keeping them safe. And then also making sure that we had a 100% uptime for all of our clients and customers around the world so that they saw no impact as far as we were concerned in their business. And in some cases, saw an increase in their capability because of how we had quickly pivoted, which then gets to this thought of why I'm on with the, our, our wonderful military 
guests today when I think of this, this ability to, to pivot. You can only pivot when you're prepared to do that. When you have the contingencies that are set forth that allow you to do that. We had that with not only our people, but also our compute power. And that's something that we said, listen, now that we've taken care of our teams and our clients, what can we do for the greater good? And we did a number of, uh, of things. One being dedicating compute power. And if you're uh, not a techie, you'll be excited to Google the term when I tell you that we, we dedicated 400 petaflops of compute capability to those researchers and others trying to figure out what was next. What are some candidates to, to come up for a cure for COVID-19? What are the patterns that we're seeing in the, in, in, in the different parts of the world where there are spikes? What could we possibly do to make sure that that power was there and available for those researchers to find new things? Now, that's the, the, the big picture to say, look, let's throw this, this compute power out there and allow people to come up with new answers. But then it, as soon as we look at the, the big challenge, we quickly come into our local communities. And we said, how can we help where our people are and where they work and where they live? And even right here in Austin, we pilot one of our uh, give back opportunities, putting good tech into a good opportunity to give back with our Watson assistant. Think of a very smart AI enabled assistant that could in fact chat if you needed to ask a question in your local um, city or county. In this case, it was the city of Austin. And you wanted to know simply, my child has has symptoms. What should I do next? Who should I call? What's the, what are the, the typical sy symptoms? And then that progressed to the ability to bring that into a contact center and have that same type of technology. Instead of spending hours on a phone asking questions to get to another question, getting to the answer when you need it, how you need it, so that you can get to results was something that we were ready to deliver very, very quickly. Now, this then brings us to a thought of from the big picture, our our, our communities, our customers, our clients into the larger capability, into the community with Watson Assistant, into one of the biggest problems that we all saw within uh, this, this pandemic, which was what used to be an ongoing challenge around supply chain, meaning a supply chain that was very brittle. Uh, supply chain that just meant getting goods and services from source to consumer. And we love all the terms, you know, from from mill to car, from farm to fork, all of those, which are typically a lot of linear transactions. What well, we found out that we're very dependent on certain parts of the world. We were very dependent uh, in seeing into a supply chain that only could give us visibility one up and one down, meaning who did I buy it from and who am I going to sell it to? When we look at it in that way, we realized, wait a minute, this is not as, as flexible as it needs to be because all of a sudden we were, we were strapped with this need for PPE, this, this need for personal protective equipment. And with that, we as IBM and specifically our blockchain team uh, said, how can we open up this supply chain with visibility and trust? And so forget the bright, shiny B word, even though that's how I earn a living uh, with blockchain. Just think of being able to see into and across a supply chain and exchange data with certainty, trust, and transparency. And with that, we took some very, very uh, innovative existing technology in the, in the form of uh, inventory visibility, as well as a blockchain platform that allowed people to basically have a, a passport into a supply chain capability so that they could match make. And what do I mean by match make? And why is that important? Well, with COVID-19, we saw some very, very unconventional pairings and matchings of need and have uh, within our supply chains, where you have a brewery that uh, is no longer brewing beer, but instead is making hand sanitizer, or a car manufacturer that is making uh, ventilators and, and designer clothing manufacturers that are making masks and protective uniforms. Think about those new industries <clears throat> sprouting up or those, those, new, those industries with new types of capabilities, changing what they're doing 
Now, how do they work in an ecosystem of medical uh, providers who are looking for that? Those matches can't be made. And with this very open and secure supply chain capability with Rapid Supplier Connect, we brought together that matchmaking capability. So just think of matchmaking on steroids for uh, supply chain capability in COVID. That's the type of innovation that we're talking about. And it doesn't stop there with the availability of data that we're now providing so that after we say, let's take care of the supply chain day to day. Now we're all looking for what's what what are the, the statistics around what we're seeing? Uh, where should I be going? Where should I be looking out with regards to exposure? If I'm in Austin, if I'm in Florida, if I'm in California, well, with our data that we have with the weather company and weather channel, we cross cross pollinate that with data from governments, the CDC and the WHO. And that then gives that real time information. So what you've seen is just an, a company that has always been there ready to do what's right, bring good tech into good opportunities to get good results. And that has been us since we tried the original moonshot to put a person on the moon and return them safely to responding to 9-11 to now responding to a pandemic with COVID-19. We know that the difference starts with the real software and the people that really employ that software for good, good tech for good results. And when I think about this thought of using that, those basics capabilities and bringing them to the marketplace with flexibility and a contingency to win, it reminds me of my first career prior to those roles that I had well before IBM. And in that first career, I graduated from United States Military Academy and proudly accepted the role as a United States Airborne Army Ranger. Uh, best job I've ever had. Enjoyed it uh, more than anything else. And in that career, what I realized that there are people such as the person that I'm about to introduce you to that wakes up every morning, goes to sleep every night, if she sleeps at all, to make sure that she is at first a servant and a warfighter ready to defend what we all believe and stand for. And with that, I'd like to take the opportunity now with that quick, quick introduction that I had on COVID-19 and what we've been doing at IBM to now introduce to you Major General Don Farrell, who is the Assistant Adjutant General Air for the Army National Guard uh, here in Texas. I'm very excited, uh, General Farrell, to have you on with me today. And if you can, just tell us a little bit about yourself and in context of what we just started talking about. I, I really would love to hear some of your insights and what you're thinking. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for that fine introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today with you and, and everybody listening in and talking about innovation and COVID, and in, and in particular, what the Texas Military Department has done. Um, my background, I have, uh, uh, I'm going to give away my age, but next month I will hit 37 years of service with the uh, Texas Air National Guard and the Texas military, so I'm very proud of that. I enlisted right out of high school, um, did 10 years enlisted service, and then uh, switched over and became an officer. Uh, I have a logistic background. Uh, I will tell you that I'm what's known as a guard baby. That means I joined the guard from the get-go. I have only ever served on active duty when I was called to, uh, to mission, for example, Desert Storm way back in the day, and I served in Afghanistan a few years ago. The rest of the time, I've, I've been in the guard. And most of that time, I have been a drill status guardsman, means the part-timer, right? which means I had a civilian career on the side. Um, my civilian career, very different from my military career, military on logistics and the civilian side. I spent most of my time in higher education um, <clears throat> where my military and my um, civilian career kinds of kind of merged. I uh, uh, went to school and graduate school and I got a doctorate in, in technology training and development. Uh, now that was, you know, 18 years ago. So technology was a little different back then. But I was very interested even then in learning about technology and how to train and develop technology in, in that case, in the, in, the, in the realm of higher education. But I've been able to transfer that over into the, to the military environment as well. I've been serving in my current position for, for about five years um, here in Austin, Texas, at Camp Mabry. And in my role here, I help the uh, adjutant general make sure that the Texas military department, which consists of the Texas Army National Guard, the Texas Air National Guard, the Texas State Guard, and quite a few civilian folks that support us, 
be prepared um, for not only our federal overseas missions, you know, deploying into the uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, or all over the world where the military is needed, but also our stateside civil or stateside domestic response mission, which is very unique to the Guard. Um, the Guard itself, uh, during a stateside emergency response um, in our in our state, we are under the um, the command of the governor. He is our commander in chief during those kinds of responses. And so uh, we are always prepared to to uh, to support the governor in any efforts that that he needs us for. We are typical military. We we train and we plan for all kinds of contingencies. And so and, and we're, we're actually pretty good at the planning. And, and, and um, of course, we all know that you can plan for something, but things always change or a little bit different than what you plan for. But, but that's OK, because we, we do plan and exercise quite a bit. And we have responded in the past to everything from floods and fires in the state of Texas to hurricanes. Uh, the, the most prominent one, Hurricane Harvey, about three years ago, that was a, a fairly devastating um, uh, uh, effort in Texas. But we responded to that. So earlier this year, when the um, when the COVID-19 started um, and it became prominent, you know, our governor, like like every other governor across the nation, was looking for how do I protect my citizens in Texas? How do I make sure that the you know, that we try to, to contain the COVID as much as possible, understand what COVID is, protect our citizens. And so it didn't take very long for him to call on the National Guard, um, the Texas Military Department, to say, hey, you know, uh, talk to our Adjutant General, Major General Tr Tracy Norris and said, I need the Guard. This is an emergency response. We, we need the Guard. And really, to start with, really relied on three main mission sets that, that we have in the Guard being logistics, communications, and medical support. As you can imagine, um, all of those things necessary. Now, understand when the Guard responds like that, we always respond in support of other agencies. We are not the lead agency. We are supportive. So we are supporting the Texas Department of Emergency Management. We are supporting the Texas Department of Health and Human Services, in this case, especially with the COVID response. And so we, we, um, we enhance and support their mission sets out there. But what we do in the Guard is we bring our military and our civilian skill sets to the table and, and even though we may be in uniform supporting as a, as, a, as, a, as a member of the Guard, we also have those civilian skill sets that we bring to the table as well to help uh, hopefully innovate um, with some solutions that are out there. And so early on when the, when the governor did ask us to respond to COVID, we did what we normally do, and that, that is fall back on the natural uh, responses and training and planning that we've done in the past. And, and that's how we set up our um, our um, our our uh, um, command structure. That's how we set up, you know, how we're going to deploy across the state to help. What was a little bit different about this than in the past is, is one, it was more of a medical mission to start with. I mean, COVID is a, is a you know, a, a, an illness a pan and it became a pandemic. So we relied a lot more on our military uh, part of the, of the, I'm sorry, medical part of the military than we did before. So General, uh, well, yes. If I, if I can on, on that question, because you're hitting on something I was, I was curious about. Um, because when we think of National Guard and, uh, as you called out, we think of emergencies, we think of natural uh, disasters more often than not, a hurricane, a Hurricane Harvey. And, yes. um, and, and, and thanks to uh, wonderful leaders such as yourself, and I know there's many, many soldiers behind those two stars that are there on your uniform, and no one gets two stars by accident. So you know what you're doing. So you show up with 33 hundred plus team members ready ready to jump onto the field saying put me in coach every day and right. then all of a sudden you show up with with uh i'll use uh north america sports you have helmets and football shoulder pads you're ready to go and all of a sudden you find out that the game's lacrosse and they're saying hey it, we you better figure out how to do what you need to do based on this new game so how do you how'd you do that i mean that's 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 not normal i mean you really had to flex Right. We did have to flex because even though we, you know, we, we do typically plan uh, for events like this, it certainly wasn't to the scale we had really anticipated. And it certainly wasn't um, probably in the case of, in this case, using the medical resources more and actually stepping in and filling in for for community members that maybe were not able to do what they what they would normally do. Now, I'll give an example. The governor asked us to, um, to provide medical support in, in terms of testing for COVID to the Texas Department of Health and Human Services. And so we, we, we uh, set up a, about 25 medical uh, testing teams, mobile medical testing teams that went all over the state of Texas. Um, most 
of us know how large the state of Texas is. So, I mean, a very, very large area. We went into rural areas because that's where uh, a lot of folks maybe didn't have access to testing before. Um, and, and so that was something that that we we had our medical folks do and, and, and train to make sure we could support the Department of Health and Human Services in doing that. Some of the other things that we did that were not, I would say, the norm for us, for example, is we ended up working in food banks and just in, in helping food banks and distributing food, uh, distributing food to the community. Now, keep in mind that most food banks are run by community volunteers. Um, you know, there may be, may be some paid personnel, but the, but the majority of their operations are, are you know, citizens um, that, are, that are volunteering, many of which are older. And they were considered a pretty high risk group, especially early on. And so with the stay at home orders that came out and the protection of our citizens, we um, we sent soldiers and airmen into food banks across the state of Texas to help um, distribute food to those who were in need. Remember, a lot of the community members weren't working at that time. Maybe they were in need um, and we, we had a greater need potentially for citizens that would need the services of a food bank than maybe in the past. Mm-hmm. So that was something very different. So, right. So how do you prepare for that? Well, I mean, right. that, it's we take our logistics skills and help set up you know, because it became a lot more um, a lot busier, I guess, at the food banks, and they really relied right. on the physical background. And it really gives a new de- definition. Right. I, I think it does give a real new definition, um, General Farrell, to this thought of a, a citizen soldier. Uh, I, I think the makeup of, of your your team, you're a lot of, of civilians in, in your force, and now you're right there as, as first responders, it, it sounds yeah. like, re- really changing the role. So not only are we first responders, but we are responding in our very own communities. Um, a lot of the, you know, we we live and work in the communities in which we serve. So not just the state of Texas, but all over. So a lot of folks uh, were working at a food bank that served their very community that they live in, or their you know their their city, their county, their their area that they live in. Same thing with the medical testing. I mean, even though our mobile testing teams went all over the state of Texas. Um, there, it, there was a very good chance that a soldier and airman on that team was was in the very area that they live in and serve in uh, as, as a civilian in, on the civilian side of that. So it was it was really fascinating. I mean, we are in the Guard, Texans serving Texas, and we take that very literally and very seriously. And this um, response to COVID was an opportunity to really show how much with our about 3,500 soldiers and airmen around the state responding to COVID, how we were really um, serving the Texans that were because of the situation, we're just not able to do certain things themselves. And so we, we looked at, you know, just that was sort of normal response. We had to kind of change the way we did it because we weren't used to doing, you know, the, the, the medical testing and that sort of working in a food bank. But we also looked for ways to help um, the Governor's Innovation Task Force get what they needed. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, personal protective equipment and how there was a shortage out there. And so our Texas Military Department Innovation Team worked with the Governor's Innovation innovative task force to try to form ideas working again with with corporate partners and civilians and folks like yourself to say how can we um, meet this need in Texas what can we do and in some cases it was the guard that that actually implemented the plan in other cases it was somebody else a corporate partner or or, or a a different agency but the Texas military department in with our innovative task force were really uh, integral into that that team and in making some of those decisions and helping the governor make decisions about things that he needed to do in response to COVID. Again, not just for the Texas military department, but for all of his um, personnel in, in the state of Texas. And that's, I, I, I tell you, you know, Texas serving Texans, uh, it, it really is true. We think about the, the spirit that we have here in Texas. And I, and I take pride in not just being a Texas resident, but also being the senior executive for the IBM company in Texas, which gives me the opportunity to do things such as what we're, we're doing here today. And I think about what what you just said is, you know, the innovation that you're bringing to the table isn't, we tend to, we as, as, as technologists think innovation and go straight to technology. And yes, as you said, General, you, you, you had technology background years ago I, and, and probably touch it every day. However, a lot of the innovation that I'm hearing is is about process. Also, um, you mentioned you know this thought of getting PPE. You you had to innovate with your supply chain and your logistics. It sounds like it sounds like your people had to think differently and act differently on command right right at the moment. Yes, yes, very much. I mean, you know, we 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 have a lot of experienced logistical officers and support officers, obviously that that do that every day. But but the makeup was a little bit different. And, and you know, where do we? How can we help the governor? warehouse some of this equipment where it can be easily 
access throughout the state. You know, obviously we have a lot of military installations and guard armories around the state. So we have a lot of facilities that can help with that. So, you know, the storage of the, uh, of the PPE took place in some of those facilities. And then we, we had to look at ways to, you know, who needs the PPE, who is it distributed to, you know, what, it, what does that look like? You know, how do we, how do we know that it's legitimate for lack of a better word? And so that was our logistical partners working with the governor's task force um, to determine, you know, what are those priorities? How do we do it? I mean, in the end, we're just the supplier. We just, we just move it, but we have to know that, that the decision makers are making the right decisions about who gets it and, and where does it go. And, you know, early on, especially that was, that was a lot of, there's a lot of controversy and who, who needed equipment, who, who, who was going to get it, what the priorities were. And, and so we were there to support that effort and making sure that whoever needed it and it was the right place to go, that we, we were able to move it across you know, the state to get it to where it needed to be. So yeah, it was, it was the same kind of logistical stuff you do, but there was a different twist to it because it couldn't be done in the same old way. I mean, we, we, we couldn't use our supply systems in the, in the military to do that. We had to do something a little bit different because, because it was a different, different way of, of supply and demand. So you're exactly right. That, that, that was a process innovation. And that was, again, us working with the governor's task force and those community partners and corporate partners on that task force with the ideas of how do we do this and how do we make those determinations so that we can tell the people in the supply chain how, how to move the supplies where they're needed. And, and so that, that was really, a, as a logistics officer, that was, a, that was pretty enlightening to me how we needed to do that because, again, you know, we're always in support of, the Guard is always in support of, we don't make those decisions uh, to begin with, we just help those um, those decision makers get the equipment in, in places where they need to be. So that was pretty exciting for me to be able to work with with outside of TMD, work with logistics folks who who don't do military logistics and, right. and sort of combine our best efforts and ideas and, and make it work. I find that uh, part of the the exciting you know outcome here. We 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 think about you know no no challenge is insurmountable and we have challenges like this only good things can come of it when you put right people in the right place with the right types of creativity and when i think of the right types of creativity and here we are you know sean hosting us from uh capital factory where we have hundreds of of startups and entrepreneurs ready to put their minds into business and, and make things happen and you're talking about new partnerships you know we've always said okay yeah the guard they're going to work with civilians but you're you're working with corporates. You're 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 touching some of these startups. Maybe maybe if you could share some some thoughts, uh, General, on what you how you see that coming together in the future. It seems like it's an evolution that well, you were in support, but now you're in partnership with right. some of these entities. No, I think it's um, in the military. It's a really interesting evolution because if you think back to you know World War II era, the defense agency, um, the defense. What was the primary idea? They, they they created the ideas. They had the information. They had the money. They had the technology to create what, what was ever needed. Um, as we as we move forward to the you know year twenty twenty, I mean, we just don't have the manpower and the and the, the and the money that we used to back. Obviously, when we had you know over a million people serving, and so we we don't all the ideas don't come from the military anymore. Now, I like to think they're very smart, innovative people inside the military. Don't get me wrong, but there are are a lot of smart, innovative people outside of the military that have ideas that they just need that foot in the door into, into a military organization say, hey, here's an idea. What do you think? Sometimes the defense agency is so large that it's very, very hard for those folks to get their foot in the door to even begin with. So what happens is we don't get their ideas because they can't get to us. In the Guard, because we are in our community all the time and we partner with and, you know we, we have people in our own com in the guard that work in the community they work in corporate america they have those same ideas we we felt it very necessary and we had a maybe an easier way than than some of getting access to those small businesses or entrepreneurs or people that just had ideas and saying come talk to us if you've got an idea we can maybe present you with with the ability to solve a problem within the military we can support you in that and so um some of the ways that we've been doing this uh, in the last few years, you know, the, the, the Air Force, the Army, there's, there's a lot of uh, innovative ideas out there and ways to try to get to our um, um, small businesses out there and, and invite them in. And some of that is through uh, partnering with them, uh, maybe through grants that, that we can, you know, help with them, uh, getting them some, some, some startup. But here at the Texas Military Department, we, we are rolling out TMDX and having a space at the Capital Factory because we want easy access for those folks to get to us. I mean, 
if, if somebody has an idea and I don't know about it, then I, there's nothing I can do to help. But if they get to me and say, hey, General Farrell, this is what we're thinking, and I may not have it all figured out, but I'm going to rely on that person to, to figure it out for me, I might need to give them the opportunity and the time and, and frankly, the, maybe some of the resources or the manpower or the equipment to try out their idea on, depending on what it is. And we're very much able to do that in the Guard because, again, we live and work right here. And, and so it makes it, I think, a lot easier for us than maybe a you know, large active duty installation to do that. And plus, we have places, you know, we're all over the state of Texas and the Texas Guard, obviously. So it's not just, we're not just in Austin. We're in San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston, all the major areas, plus many, many, many rural areas. And so we, we can tap into the talent in the community um, just by opening our doors and saying, come talk to us. We're not intimidating. We really, really want your ideas. We want to help you. Um, and, and I think by doing that, 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 that folks in small businesses or folks that just have an idea, maybe they're a college student, maybe they're a housewife or a house husband, and they just have an idea that they have a, a mechanism to get that information to us. And through our uh, innovation, TMDX, we have personnel that help sort of screen that for us so that we can mm -hmm. look at things that we know we can partner with them on. Um, or frankly, if we don't have the capability, we can get them in touch with the right organization that can do that. And I that's think we when we looked at the working with COVID and the tech and the governor's task force, that's exactly what we did. And most of the representatives on the were, were, you know, um, big wigs in the civilian community, like you CEOs and that sort, but they still had people that work for them that had ideas to bring. And then that's, that's how you, that's how you problem solve. In this case, uh, it was for a crisis or an emergency, but we want to do it for everyday kinds of things. And that's why partnering with the small businesses and the entrepreneurs out there is so important to us. And, and I think we've made great strides in doing that. It's uh, Okay. Oh, good. And I'll tell you, I won't take it personally. A general, you say big wig and I happen to be a bald man. So um, <laughs> I won't, uh, I won't uh, give you a hard time for that one. Uh, far from big wig. I just have a, a, a lot of uh, great team, team members here across the state of Texas. And, and, you know, talking about that, that innovation, I did give a shout out to the capital factory and I, also know, you know, here we are home to the Army Futures Command by no no accident um, because Austin and Texas as a whole is a hotbed for innovation and it really drives these new ideas. And I think about all these entrepreneurs that are even listening now uh, are ready to, you know, put their wares uh, to work for good causes. Um, I also know that you have some innovation when I think about some of the things that that you, as you mentioned, you have logisticians day in and day out that are, are moving things that some corporations couldn't even imagine moving. And I do mean materials, but then materials at scale and the distance um, and the needs that are unique to the military. Um, anything you can share on that? Because I, I know that you had some, some, some innovations around predictive maintenance, for example, that, that you all have been able to, to bring into play. Some of the things that you, because people don't think about this. They always, I, I, I uh, having been in the military, I say, hey, look, a lot of the innovation comes from the military because we're dealing with problems that are different than the civilian world. So anything, anything there that you can, you can shine some light on. Sure. I, I think um, you give the example of predictive maintenance. Um, you know, in, in, in the military, sometimes we, we do things um, and we do them very well, but we do them the same way forever and ever. Amen. Just because that, you know, that's what you're comfortable with. A lot of people will do that. But when you're in a time of, of, you know, money crunch and manpower crunches and you just don't have the same resources you used to have before, you have to change the way you do business. And so predictive maintenance is one of those things. I mean, it's 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 done in the airline industry all the time, right? I mean, they, they, they've they got predictive maintenance down. Mm -hmm. And the military is looking to those models to say, hey, how can we do that? How can we better utilize it in the military? Not only will I keep our airplanes in the air longer and keep them flying, but it'll, it'll and it'll save the downtime that sometimes they have to go in when they go to depot maintenance. But it's just it's just it just makes good business sense. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? We just have to work with our community partners and say, how do you do this? And, and what can we learn from you? And, and oh, by the way, sometimes the exchange is twofold. I mean, they learn from us as well. We uh, Another example is is pilot training next. Uh, a lot of folks that if you're kind of tracking the military, you know that there was, there was a pretty big pilot shortage in the military. And so it takes a long time to get a traditional pilot trained, get him you know, into, into school and in, in the flying hours. And we started looking at ways to make that a little bit um, less time, but still effective. And the guard uh, partnered with uh, the Air Education and Training Command, out a you know, major command out of San Antonio, to look at pilot training. And we actually had pilot training next that was that was out here at, at our Army Guard facility at 
Austin uh, Berkshire International Airport. It wasn't on a wasn't on an Air Force base. It was out at partnering with our with our Army brothers over at ABIA, and it was a pilot program, and it got introduced. and And, and every time they they're doing it, it's tweaking it. They're they're doing things. Um, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, a lot of this stuff out there that is that is being done and, and we're borrowing techniques and we're and we're creating techniques from our community partners because it's 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 a new way of doing business and it's sometimes a hard sell uh, when you change the right. way you do things. It it is because um you know you can look at, at education today, how people learn today in higher education is so different from fifty years ago. And um, so I mean, you, you have to adapt in some ways. It, it doesn't have to take away from the quality, though. That, you know, we are absolutely not looking to take away from quality at all. We're looking it's, to keep the quality or make it better, but have innovative ideas and ways to, to do it better and more efficiently. You, you, you're so right, uh, General Farrell, because we think about how we're doing this now. We're not uh, live. We're virtual. And this has definitely, you know, stretched what people typically accept as the norm. And as you say, people aren't getting education the same way. And it's a, a shameless opportunity to talk about uh, some of the things that we see going forward because this is innovation on COVID. In fact, we we globally as as IBM have seen that this thought of of learning and what it takes to really to really get an education, get a certification and do work is much different. We sponsor a program uh, and created a program called Pre-Tech. It's Pathways in Technology in Early College High School. And there's high school students that will, will never go get a four-year degree. And it only takes a two-year degree in, in the six-year high school program that we put into place. So as you say, people are learning different. That's why we have Skills Build, which is another program that's totally virtual and using, I'm going to say the B word, blockchain certification. Those Those credentials, that badge that you have now been certified in this type of technology, you can do that. So when we think about the outcomes of COVID, we're all ordering things online more so than just our, our Amazon <laughs> orders, but food, we're, we're not, you know, touchless transmission, touchless payments, things that are different. And so it's very exciting when I, I know that we have military innovation and innovators like yourself that are doing it with technology, but also with the people in process um, that is that is this uh, that feeling that does keep us safe when we say, are we being taken care of? Yes, the civilian soldiers and leaders such as yourself, General Farrell, um, honored to be talking with you today and, and really excited about uh, what you've shared. Looks like we're, we're going to go ahead and take some time now. And instead of just us talking, even though I could keep on, I've got a whole list of questions, but I'm going to put a hold on my, my questions. And if I can, I want to. Um, pass it back to, I think, Sean and the team are going to help us uh, moderate some questions from the audience who I, I know from what I've seen. Uh, normally you have a person in your ear, you know, an ear mic. But now as I look, I've got there's 10 people on the side of my screen telling me what to do. So <laughs> I'll follow I'll follow orders. I'll be a good soldier here. And back to you, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to keep you guys on your toes here with some questions that are coming in from the live chat. We've had a few throughout the conversation. By the way, thank you both General Farrell and, and to Jason for a really awesome conversation about a super, super important topic. So we have a couple questions coming from the audience. Uh, I want to start with this question here. Um, we have a question from Ross. This one is for Jason. And Ross Schott is asking, um, you know, with all of the things that you're talking about from a research perspective, are your researchers looking at using quantum systems to uh, work with COVID and potentially even do things like testing antigens? Absolutely. So for those that, that don't know, when you think of uh, quantum computer, quantum computers make our standard computers look as though they're standing still. Uh, think of a pocket calculator compared to what you have and and now the highest speed uh, Z series system that's running the highest security government system on the planet. Um, that's what we're looking at with quantum. So just to give you a thought of uh, in, in layman's terms, what we're talking about. So absolutely, when we think of the modeling that um, we can put into place using quantum computing with regards, with, with regards to what is it, what are the potential situations, mutations of a disease, and what are the possible capabilities and and uh, configurations for a potential remedy. Now, 
it's easy to just point out a computer, but I tell you, none of that happens. And I, and I joked earlier about the software. So this is with uh, human research involved. And so, yes, our researchers who still year on year now for almost 12, 15 years have led in the number of patents, they are taking that, that intellectual knowledge and capability to point it at, at this disease so that we can find a cure for now and then also anticipate what we may need to keep this from happening again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, General Farrell, we have a question coming in for you from uh, Brian Cook. You mentioned you know, ways that you're connecting with small businesses and startups across the state, and especially here in Austin. I think th his question here is, what's the best way uh, for those startups, for people out in the, the tech ecosystem to actually connect with you all and let you know, here's a solution that we have for you know, the new normal of COVID? Oh, that's that's a great question, and I really appreciate that. Um, the first thing is, you know, this this week we're doing our TMDX launch out at the Capital Factory. We've had some space out there for a while, but we're actually um, uh, introducing, if you will, TMDX, um, Texas Military Department X, to the the civilian community. So we will have office and space out there, and then also we have a website, um, tmd.texasgov backslash tmdx, um, which which is a, is a good way to go on and go on and see what's going on with, within TMDX. And also I'm going to throw out a name because he's sitting in the room with me. And that is our chief innovation officer here at Texas military department. And that's major Alex um, Goldberg. And he is my go-to and the tags go-to person in terms of if anybody wants to connect and find out what challenges we're facing and get a foot in the door, then he will steer you in the right direction, whether it's something that the air can work on, the army can work on or our civilian sector. And so, uh, those are three main ways that we that we can connect, and and, and I can get um, his uh, his email address and number to you guys as well, so that they can have a direct connection. I'm fairly certain that almost everybody in the state knows Alex Goldberg, and if they don't, they're going to meet him eventually. Um, Alex Goldberg is someone I even even know the Sherpa. I wrote that down yesterday. We're taking notes, so if you need to get get to something, Alex Goldberg is the first. Right. I know that. Yes, you guys are absolutely right. And if you don't know Alex Goldberg, Goldberg you probably know Stoike. That's and right. he's the same person, by the way. And yes, you're right. He is he is uh, the really the the guy, um, the go to guy here at the Texas Military Department um, that will really help help connect us with the community and the community back with us or small businesses so we can solve problems. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's great to have a, an amazing connector like Stoike. Um, working with you all and connecting everybody in the community. Okay, so this is a question for uh, um, Major General Farrell again. Uh, this is from Welton Chase. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you all are doing to kind of resource up and modernize um, enterprise networks to leverage modern technologies? What what is the the you know the strategy along those lines? Well, I appreciate that question. I think that's probably, in my opinion, one of the toughest things that we have to do, not just within the TMD, but within the military. And then as uh, I'll tell you, a lot of our infrastructure and, and, and in terms of technology and networks that support the airmen and soldiers are, are, are fairly archaic. And the undertaking to update those and upgrade those to the to the needs uh, are are so, so much more challenging than I, than I frankly can even comprehend sometimes. When you look at, I'm going to give an example of human resources, and that's that's that seems kind of you know trivial, but you know taking care of airmen and soldiers is just as important to me as it as as it is to Mr. Kelly taking care of his employees. And we need to have the the right systems so that we can understand who they are, where they are, what they need, make sure they get the right benefits and services, uh, just like anything else. You know, corporate America has that solved, I think, um, and and. For me and, and sort of my naivety, naivety, you know, I'm like, why don't we just copy what's going on at IBM or, or anybody else? And and it, it's probably a little more challenging than just that. But I will tell you that we 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 like to look at at our civilian sector to see where, where we can benchmark. Now, I cannot speak for the entire Department of Defense. Understand what I can speak for, though, is the Texas Military Department and and partnering with with folks out in the community that can help us at least meet the needs here in the state. Uh, even though we still have DOD systems that we're 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 attached to, obviously there are other innovative ways. I think that we can we can leverage technology to better serve our airmen and soldiers, and thus better serve the the, the citizens of Texas. I think Sean went to mute. 
There we go. Thank you very much. We wouldn't be a uh, video conference if, if we didn't have somebody talking on mute. So uh, Jason, this question is actually for you along those lines of you know leveraging different mechanisms. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the SBIR funding program. And mm -hmm. that's that's become a huge mechanism for startups and small businesses. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you've seen in th that area of of you know funding mechanisms and development? How's IBM supporting that, and how are you seeing that kind of change the landscape? Well, we like to look at ourselves as a, a complement to uh, multiple funding sources. SBR is one of those. When I say a complement, is that we bring capability uh, for those startups. We locally, for example, with Capital Factor, we have a location at the Capital Factor. We try and put ourselves as, uh, as for, far forward, and, and now I get to use a military term since I'm on with General Farrell. Uh, just, just comes out, General, you have to forget it, but the forward edge of battle, the, the FIBA. We're right, right there because that's where we're going to connect with those, those startups. Uh, we make sure that we, we sponsor uh, capabilities uh, and programs such as our call for code for COVID-19 where we say, listen, we have not only uh, set the, the program for those to, to then, you know, if you want to even call it a hackathon, it's better than that. You know, this thought of call for code where we then can award additional funding, $200,000 in this case, in the latest call for code for COVID-19 for those big ideas to take them forward. So that's what uh, we tend to do is to make sure that we are putting skin in the game by having programs as well as education. I mentioned that before online to enable these startups to, to come up to speed and also get close to our capability and technology that we have, because there's no reason for us to keep it inside our walls. And we know that an open architecture is the one that we, we, we sponsor and we promote. So that's how we like to, let's say, complement those types of programs. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, General Farrell, can you comment on that with SBIR and how uh, TMDX is, is leveraging SBIR funding? Oh yes, I'm. A, you know, we're we're a we're a big fan of and partner with uh, SBR funding. Uh, we have uh, we have sponsored multiple companies in phase one and phase two cyber grants. That that uh, the beauty of doing that is not only do they help us solve a problem, but there's also matching funds that come from, in this case, the big Air Force. That that really helps uh, the small business in terms of of doing whatever kind of of of, of research they have to do to get where they need to be and, and to help us solve the problems. So we've got, we've got some pretty exciting things going on. Uh, I'll give you an example with, um, you know, in, in solving a problem when you're looking at, um, uh, you know, a, a, a prevalent problem in the, in the, in the military. And I'm going to use the air force as examples since we fly airplanes and that is, you know, airplane parts, you know, unfortunately our fleet of aircraft are, are older than they've ever been before and um, sometimes require you know more maintenance more aircraft parts and, and frankly there's some some uh, places that not only can you not really even get the aircraft part but if you can it has to be built in and in, in that sort and sent and and it's just it's a very cumbersome thing um, and and guess what we leverage with some companies to look at the possibility of 3d printing aircraft parts now, for those that are not familiar with 3D printing, as I was not a few years ago, that was I was just like, what? But the reality of it is there are there are many multiple, multiple parts of an airplane that can be 3D printed right at the shop, you know, right at the maintenance shop. If you've got the right technology and you've got the right uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that they're they're quality, obviously. And so we are partnering with with folks to 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 do that, to uh, to not only create the parts and, and to standard, but also get them certified. And so, you know, what does that do? Not only does that put the maintenance right back, you know, in the shops where the, the experts are, but it saves time. And, and frankly, it saves a lot of money. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we, that we are looking at Cibber doing. And that's just a big example of, you know, um, Major Goldberg will talk about this a little bit later in one of his panels, but also, you know, 3D, 3D printing of buildings. Again, you know, if, if you're not familiar with 3D printing of buildings, that it, it's it's almost un, you know unheard of in terms of understanding. But but we're going to have some of that done. We're partnering with the company. We're having some of that done right here. We're going to have some uh, some uh, buildings 3D printed out at Camp Swift, which is down in Bastrop, and it's going to be really exciting because they're they're going to be able to work with us. What do you need in a facility? What does it need to look like? You know, the, the, the basic infrastructure for that, and, and then and then going from there. That is all working with with small business and innovative ideas out there that have, that that we have worked with over the last few years and say, here's a need we have. How can you help us? And then partnering, and then again, the Cibber is just a way to help um, ease the pain, if you will, on the amount of money it takes to actually develop some of those ideas. 
Yeah, that's really, really interesting stuff. And I think you talked a lot about Texas serving Texans. And I know we have such a robust tech community across the state, not just here, here in Austin, but in Dallas and Houston and San Antonio. That notion of hex, Texans helping Texas, uh, Texans help, serving Texans, how can we as average citizens, you know, step up in this this fight of, against COVID and, and what's what's a way for us to pitch in? What recommend, recommendations do you have for kind of just, you know, the viewers who are watching who may or may not have a great idea, but they just want to, you know, get involved? Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, I, I, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, again, you know, in, in the in the Texas Guard, I mean, we have citizens that are serving in the Guard. So we, we're already out there in the communities living and serving and working, you know, right next with our neighbors. So a lot of times um, just, just talking with folks like that, that, that we just work with every day, you know, maybe I work in a civilian, maybe I work for IBM during, you know, full time and then I'm, you know, I do the, the traditional guard drill, but also uh, just, just reaching out. And, you know, if, if you're a citizen or you're a small business owner or somebody with an idea and you think, wow, that seems to be a problem. Um, I've got an idea to, to solve it. And I'll just use, you know, PPE as an example, obviously personal protective equipment was as a, at a shortage to begin with. There were probably, millions of different ideas out there that uh, we were able to capture some of it, but maybe, maybe not all of it. And that's just in Texas. That's just with the governor's task force. That's just us. But you know, there were other, other ideas out there because you could see where PPE production across the nation increased in a lot of different innovative ways. You know, sometimes, sometimes maybe you put, you know, you're, you took two steps forward and one step back. And, and, and to me, I think a lot of it was about educating the public about the types of different types of PPE and what they mean. I mean, you know, this is for our, our, our emergency health workers that need it for full protection. This is used for this. This is used for this. So not only developing the product, but also communicating to the citizens what the purpose is and, and how it's different from something else. And in the case of us, you know, our, one of our 3D printing companies that we were partnered with, uh, we actually uh, partnered with them to, to shift from, from printing airplane parts to print to uh, printing 3D printing masks for the uh, uh, airmen and soldiers within the Texas military department because we didn't want to, to contribute to the shortage, right? We wanted to be part of the solution. And so we're not going to go take away from, we're going to use our own resources uh, with our with our civilian partner to create that. So uh, I hope that answers your question, but I mean, we just, we just from my perspective, I, I just like to capture the ideas and we'll if you've got an idea, we'll figure out where to put it, we'll figure out what bucket to put it in in terms of, of making it come to fruition. And yeah. Sean, it's worth worth noting that uh, that that uh, doesn't stop uh, with where we're where we're at right now in the current crisis. There is eventually going to be a return to the workplace phase of this, and as people return, there's going to be even more concerns, even more needs, even more innovation needed. So, you know, uh, underlining that question is one that says. Yes, just as General Farrell pointed out, you can get involved and be ready to be involved for the long haul because we are just in the first first half of what I, I think is going to be a, a a long game and a long play. Yeah, and and I, that's a great point. You actually brought up a lot of really interesting points about what IBM is doing to train, you know, even high school students as they're looking to college and beyond. Um, can you put on your kind of like predict the future hat and and suggest what are the the technologies that young people should be engaging in learning about? What are some of the the domains that you think will be those those future um, technologies that we're going to need to to have know how about? And, and Jason, you can answer that question or, or well, first. Carol. First, I'll, I'll build off of your question and pass it to General Farrell with re regard to you know what I mentioned with our P Tech program and also our Skills Build program, which is online and, and free to anyone who wants to learn. We we made those bets years ago uh, with now 150 uh, thousand students in the program, uh, over 200 schools, uh, and we partner. That's not just IBM. We partner with other other companies and it's a private partner, uh, private public partnership and all of those. So we made a bet then that the future workforce, the future workforce with 700,000 jobs going unanswered every year, tech jobs going unanswered, we know that has to change and so we invested before that. We know that we have uh, a, a very, very, and I would like to say the best education system on the planet in the form of the military. I believe that that uh, the the soldiers that we have and the warfighters 
become the best, best groomed and prepared and mentored future workforce of where we need to go uh, with regards to talent. And then your last point is, you know, what are the future technologies? It's easy to call out technologies that right now I could, you know, artificial intelligence, which we call augmented intelligence, because ultimately there's a human that's going to use that uh, internet of things, blockchain, uh, these things that work with data, anything touching data is going to be key. And then with regards to, you know, what should they be studying and what should they be looking to do? What's going to be needed isn't, a, isn't here now. We don't know what that is. What we want them to be is mentally prepared to go for the long haul and to be innovative, to be collaborative, to work with others, to be diverse, accepting, and never, never being satisfied for second best. Uh, and thus, it kind of, kind of, kind of leaps me back toward one of the best preparatory schools on the face of the planet, with this, which is our U.S. military. Absolutely, General Farrell. So I'll, I'll, I'll tap on that, and I'll do a shameless plug for the military in terms of of having folks join, whether it's active duty, guard, reserve, to get some of those skill sets. But also, I, I want to touch on you know what you said um, about data and in data driven decision making, which is you know. A lot of people live and breathe that every day, but but many people do not. You know, they 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 rely on intuition or gut or different things. I think that that you know you you have to look at data and you have to see what's coming down the pike so that you can plan for it. You have to know what's what's coming, if you will. And if you don't, if you're not sure what the answer is, and that's when you collaborate. That's when you reach out. I mean, no one person or entity organization has the answers, right? But, but you can't let the surprise, you know, kind of take you off, off track. I'll give an example. A very good friend of mine is a president of a college here in Texas. And we were talking a few weeks ago about COVID and the impact. And, and you guys know that education is having to make a lot of decisions about the future, you know, classroom instruction, all those sorts of things. And, and my colleague was, was, was working very hard to, you know, to gather information. And, and I went to grad school with her and she, she jokingly said in exasperation one day, they didn't teach us this in grad school. And she's exactly right. They did not teach the you know future president of this college to, to know what to do in here. So what does she do? She has to collaborate with the community. She has to bring in the experts to help her with the decision making. Give me the data. I've never faced this before. It's, it's not a pride thing. It's a, I need help in making these decisions. And I think every organization entity is the same way. You know, here at the Texas Military Department, we're not proud. We need help in solving some of our problems. We, we need to reach out and we want to reach out with our community, our corporate and our small business partners to help us. That's what innovation is all about in, in my mind. Absolutely. I think you, you said it really well. Just if you're not sure what to work on, just collaborate. And that is something that, you know, as a former classroom teacher and, you know, having been working in tech for the last 10 years, it it goes without saying here at Capital Factory and at hubs like ours and places around Texas where these things are happening, find somebody who's working on something really challenging and help them. Um, I think that's that's a key for for us, and I think uh, something that you know you you all in your your work have have definitely seen. So um, I think that's about all the time that we have here. Uh, so thank you both, Jason and and General Farrell, for your time today. Really appreciate you guys being here. It was thank my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to you, Capital Factory, as well as uh, Deloitte for hosting this. Yep, absolutely.